Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Well, in our uh, high level trip through the Bible, book by book, uh, that we're doing so rapidly, this session we want to look at the book of Daniel. If you have an intellectual bent and you'd kind of like to know if the Bible is true or not, you can start in Daniel because it lays out the, the uh, events of world history uh, thousands of years in advance and it has turned out to be true and it is a marvelous place to take your intellect and see what God is willing to do. Now, not everybody would believe that the, way, the way that I do. But in the, in the big sense of things, what does this book of Daniel tell us about God? Well, we're doing a, a short history, a short trip through the Bible here at the end of our long 10-year course, trying to focus on that particular issue. And there are lots of things that the book of Daniel says to us about God. And not every one of those things is acceptable to everybody, uh, as you've already suggested. Um, historically, let's just set out the history first in case uh, some may not be, just have that on the tip of their tongues. Historically, Daniel was a character who grew up in Jerusalem, probably at the age of about 17, was taken uh, captive along with several of his friends um, that we usually call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were their Babylonian names. And taken to Babylon where they were uh, included in, in, among the high-level people in Babylon, were tried by various methods. They, they excelled in their studies in the University of Babylon, if you will. And then they were, they were be, catapulted, really, to top positions in the nation because they were able to interpret dreams, Daniel was. And various other things happened in the book. The book is roughly divided half and half between stories about their experiences and prophecies, which um, people have a lot of different ideas about how they should be interpreted, how they should be understood, etc. And how you deal with that says a lot about your understanding of the Bible and your understanding of God. Let's start out with the first big issue uh, here, and that's if you believe the book was written by Daniel, that means it would have to have been written somewhere during the 6th century BC, somewhere between probably 580 B.C., maybe 590 B.C., the first parts of it, that's when the events happened. We don't know exactly when, they're written, when it was written down until around about 530 uh, B.C., probably the final events that are recorded in the book took place. By contrast, many of our Christian friends, scholars, will say that because of their a priori philosophical assumption that not even God can predict the future, then it, it would be impossible for Daniel to have predicted future events. Therefore, the, whoever wrote this book, therefore it could not have been Daniel because he predicts things far in advance, whoever wrote the book must have, must have lived somewhere down about 160 or 170 years before Christ, not six, 500 years before Christ. So that's the first major issue. And let me just throw that out to the group. Um, how do we feel about that? Can God foretell the future? These people philosophically say, if God can foretell the future, then that wipes out our freedom. 
Is that true or not? That doesn't wipe out our freedom. It doesn't? We can tell the future. In well, some, in not some 500 limit, years in advance. No, no, but in some limited capacity. Yeah. Yeah. We can tell what's <clears throat> happening with uh, stocks and commodities based on events in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now we know that if we uh, produce uh, fuel out of corn, as an example, there will be riots all around the world because all prices of food will go up. Mm -hmm. We know that certain things happen. It, it has an effect on gold and silver. We know that if one nation offends another nation or something's happening, we know that a war is brewing. We know all these things. So God, who created everything, sure, he knows. You know, even more than that, people believe that God can hear your prayer. Mm -hmm. And when you look down at the earth from outer space, you see how many millions of people are there on the earth. Okay, mm -hmm. if all of them started praying, People believe that God can hear every prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay, this kind of God, then they don't believe, can create a world in six days and cannot tell the future. Right. I mean, if a God has power to be with us individually when there are millions of us on this earth, what's the big deal about the other things? I mean, mm -hmm. we are gonna be presented with a being after we die and, and are resurrected, that we can't even imagine how intelligent this, this being is. Mm -hmm. and, and we're judging him by our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my question is, what kind of God do they believe in? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you have a God that's just a big human, you know, as you, He's got a big head, you know, with big brain that can do everything that she says. Um, maybe it's true, mm -hmm. but maybe God is a totally different mono, uh, mono species, you know, in the universe that's completely different than what we are. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, if you started talking about um, uh, quantum mechanics and all this stuff as far as time goes and all this that and the other thing, you know, maybe his life reaches into that somehow. And, um, you know, who knows? Who knows? But starting with that assumption, mm -hmm. let, let's let them have that. They don't really try to sell that in per se. They try to, to give some evidence uh, from, the, from the book itself. And so for a while, uh, they said, well, these, these people... Daniel and Belshazzar and this whole this whole narrative here, no evidence of that anywhere outside the Bible, so uh, forget it. Mm -hmm. Then came the Ebla tablets and about that were written about what about 2200 BC, yeah. and here was Daniel and here was Belshazzar mm -hmm. here were the names of these people yeah. and so that whole argument kind of went out the door if you go to the British Museum yes when were those written I'm sorry yes. actually he ones he's talking about were written around 600 to well about 500 BC not, not before before yeah yeah that far from now, <laughs> yeah. that old and if you go to the British Museum I've been there several times and they keep it on display a little clay cylinder and there it talks about Nabonidus and his son Belshazzar who was in charge, he was leaving in charge of Babylon. So all those arguments are gone. And there's been a lot of arguments about how the language in the book of Daniel doesn't fit that time period. All those arguments have disappeared because we now know it's exactly the kind of language which was used in Babylon in Daniel's day. And they have said that you know, the, the book of Daniel can't be a prophetic book. It couldn't have been written so long ago because it's in the third part of the canon, the Old Testament. It should, if it was a really a prophetic book written back in those days, it should have been in the second part of the canon. And all those arguments just d don't hold any water. I mean, you can, you can look at that. I mean, Daniel was not only a prophet, he was a statesman, he was a ambassador, he was a, a prime minister. And this accounts for the language he used and the, the books he wrote and the other things separate from the fact that he was a prophet at times. So all of the arguments that have been brought up by the critics have one by one fallen. 
There's one or two still objections that they have, but they're very minor compared to the ones that they started out with. And in every case that has been able to be proven so far, the book of Daniel has proven to be correct. And so here we have the actual source material itself, <clears throat> valuable material, and we disregard it because there's nothing else around to substantiate it. Mm -hmm. And we just set it aside, ignore it, think it's fantasy. Losing valuable time at, at, at accessing this valuable information and then in time other source materials come to validate it. It's a, mm. it's a pity that we, we, you know, we just ignore the very source that it's a, what, 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 makes, what makes people want to do that? What, what, uh, when you read, well, Daniel, why do, you, why do you, I mean, it's guys, neat stuff. Why in the world would anybody want to discredit well, it? Well, uh, there's a very good reason for that. The book of Daniel very clearly says, says that a day is coming when God will judge the world and every one of us will stand before him in judgment. They don't want to know that. They don't want that to happen. They don't want to believe that. They don't want to believe that. And if you, if you accept the whole book of Daniel and you accept it historically accurate, you've got to accept a lot of things that they don't want. And we'll, we'll talk about those. That's, what, that's where we'll go before we're done here, I hope. There's a lot of things in the book of Daniel they don't want to accept. And it's better to throw up this smoke screen uh, that, instead, of, instead of accepting the facts. Doesn't the book of Daniel say, I, Daniel? Yes. So who would write a book that says, other than Daniel, that says, I, Daniel? Or do well, they? Well, somebody's lying. <laughs> <laughs> is that a possibility? <laughs> well, but there, there are actually a lot of other apocryphal books that are written that way. Oh, okay. That claim to be, lots of them written, claiming to be written by the apostles that clearly were not written by the apostles in New Testament times, for example. But any book in the Bible like that? Well, not in the Bible, but of course these people would raise some questions maybe about why this, whether this book should be here too. Mm. Well, a couple of very interesting historical notes that, uh, that are documented, they're extra-biblical, that I think would be worth noting in this respect, and we don't want to spend our whole time talking about philosophical issues here. But Jerome, who lived from 347 A.D. to 420 A.D., now this is, what, 300, a little over 300 years after Christ was here on this earth, and he's, by the way, the one who translated the... Uh, from Hebrew and Greek into Latin and produced the official uh, translation of the Roman Catholic Church called the Vulgate. And it's still the official translation of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible. The, the Bible. The, the entire Bible. And that man said these words, I wish to stress that none of the prophets has so clearly spoken concerning Christ as has this prophet Daniel. For not only did he assert that he would come, a prediction common to the other prophets as well, but also he set forth the very time at which he would come. Moreover, he went through the variations, I'm sorry, the various kings in order, stated the actual number of years involved, and announced beforehand the clearest signs of events to come. Those are Jerome's words, written 300 plus years after Christ. But maybe an even more impressive statement was made by Josephus. Now, Josephus was a Jewish historian that lived about the time of Jesus. In his Antiquities, Book 11, pages 330, or well, Numbers 333 to 339, he said these, he made these comments. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, now this is talking about the time when Alexander the Great was sweeping through the world and he came down to um, Judah and on his way to Judea on his way down to conquer Egypt, which he did. As he arrives in Judea, this is, this is Josephus' comment. And when was this? When and this would be around 332 or 33 B, I'm sorry, 322, 23 BC. This is 150 years before the book of Daniel was even written, according to the critics. Uh, but of course, several hundred years after the book of Daniel was written, if you believe it was actually written by Daniel. And this is the comment. When the book of Daniel was showed him, that is Alexander the Great, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. 
And as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. But the next day he called them to him and bade them ask what favors they pleased of him. Whereupon the high priest desired that they might enjoy the laws of their forefathers and might pay no tribute on the seventh year. He granted all they desired. And when they entreated him that he would permit the Jews in Babylon and Media to enjoy their own laws also, he willingly promised to do hereafter what they desired. And when he said to the multitude that if any of them would enlist themselves in his army on this condition that they should continue unto the law, under the law of their forefathers and live according to them, he was willing to take them with him. Many were ready to accompany him in his wars. So basically, if you read the whole story, and I didn't have, don't want to take time to read the whole story, when Alexander swept down there, the Jews, instead of fighting him, just went out and said, look, we have a book that predicted a long time ago that you were come and that you were going to do all the things you've done. And so we're not going to fight you. And he was so amazed. He said, yeah, tell me about it. And he went on like this and proceeded on his way to Egypt and didn't fight with the Jews at all. Isn't there something else in Daniel about him being cut off early or something? No, not about uh, Alexander. Alexander the Great, isn't there? Um, not that I remember. right now. there might be. Well, I was just well yes, 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 there is, actually. It talks about the great horn that was broken off, and then four other horns came up. They didn't show him that part, though. Well, I don't know <laughs> if they did or not. <laughs> yeah. But I think we've said enough about that issue in the book of Daniel. What other things does the book of Daniel tell us about God? That God protects you in the midst of trial. Uh, the... Um, well, let's, let's, let's put that. In other words, now you're talking about God's dealing with them as individual people. Okay. We're not talking about prophecies and world governments. We're talking about God's <laughs> dealing with individual people involved in the book of Daniel. What does that teach us about God? Well, in, in certain circumstances, He will intervene when um, his, his followers are in danger. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have um, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. We have the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. Um, we have even uh, the story of God um, interacting with Nebuchadnezzar, this king, yeah. and working to, um, to, to convert that man to the worship of the, of the one true God. And the story seems to indicate that uh, Nebuchadnezzar at least made some alter, alteration in, yeah. in, his, uh, in his adoration of, of, the, of God. Yeah. Looks like also God blessed a, a vegetarian diet. Well, Daniel 1 starts out very interesting, doesn't it? And it talks about these young men who arrived, and what did they say to the, to the head master there? Give us a chance to eat the way we want, and then you can test us. <laughs> okay, and what happened? Well, according to that, it, they were 10 times better Mm -hmm. in, in what? In, in how long was it? Well, ten there days, were ten, I believe. In 10 days, the, what the Bible says literally, after 10 days they were fairer and fatter. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what my translation says. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if I want to be fairer and fatter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it says, but those were considered to be uh, good things in those days. They, they obviously were considered better off than, than their rivals after 10 days. And so the man says, well, go ahead and continue with. And what kind of a diet did they actually eat? Do we know? Uh, How can you get fat things? on it too? Vegetable stew. Okay. Is it vegetable stew? Um, could meaning? fatter mean more muscular? <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah. Um, probably healthier and more robust. Yeah, healthier and more robust. And how do you suppose that uh, they did so much better on the final exams than their competitors? They didn't have a sugar high weighing down their brain. Well, not only that, what else did these they friends... Didn't have, they didn't have alcohol weighing down on their brain also. Yeah. Their, their friends probably drank a lot of alcohol. And they got water and vegetables. That's what they ate for three years. And they did very well on that diet. Three, we can, we can think years? of that as purely being due to the diet that they ate. But I think their connection with God and their trust in Him, He might have had some blessing that He added to their diet. 
Do you think a God who could reveal all these prophecies to Daniel could also help him with the final exam? I suspect so. <laughs> you know, I keep thinking, you know, about this diet that they ate salad all the time. You think that's what it is, or could it be? No, more likely vegetable soup or something well, like that. Was, yeah. was it vegetables or was it non-meat? Was yeah. it vegetables, well, for sure it was fruits, and grains? Possibly. Or was yeah. it just fruits, grains, and nuts like the original diet in Eden? Yeah, possibly. Did it include beans? Probably. Okay. Also, the fact, perhaps, that they were allowed to eat their diet that they wished probably made them happier. They felt free, no longer constrained by the, by the palace, so they, they looked better, they looked mm -hmm. happier. There a blessing. Were, there are, however, two reasons, two different reasons, why they preferred this diet. Do you know what those two reasons are? Food was offered to idols. The and second meat, issue is meat. that all of the king's food was offered to the idols, to their, do, to their quote, gods, before it was served. So if they ate the king's food and then excelled in their examinations, it would be assumed that these people who had come from Judea and now were a part of the Babylonian court, doing well in their final examinations, were now being blessed by? The Egyptian gods. Marduk. The Egyptian no, the Babylonian, Babylonian gods. Babylonian gods. Babylonian gods. So the fact that they rejected this food did what? The it king's just food. The opposite. Yeah. It proved that the evidence of the pagan deity. Well, it it, at least, sure. at least, at least, there's no way they could claim that Marduk or Bel had been the one that blessed them and, and made it possible for them to do so well in their examinations because they didn't eat his food or their food, if you will. Now, now would that that logic work with, um, no, would Paul's logic work at that time, where he says, well, you can eat all the food you want. Who cares if it was offered to idols? It's, they're just dumb things anyway. Yeah. So the, the situation was very different in Paul's day. Um, you, if you went to the market, you couldn't buy food that hadn't been offered to idols. And Paul said, the facts are is that is that, you know, that food is not affected by the metal or the tin or the, or the stone or whatever that those idols are made out of. Didn't affect it at all. At all. And so therefore, you, if you have faith and you, you trust in God, you can go and eat that food and it won't affect you at all. In Daniel's day, the difference wasn't whether the food would affect them. The difference was people believed it would affect them. So they needed to do a different thing. They did just the opposite. They refused to eat the food because people would believe that if they did well eating the food, then it was because of the gods. Paul's day was, does it really affect the food? And the answer is no. Well, in, Daniel's day was, in Daniel's day, it was a question of, did people believe it affected the food? Yes, they did believe it affected the food. Well, he kind of almost turned it around. He said, if you eat the food, well, then you're going to prove to them that it doesn't do any, didn't make any difference. So, well, yeah. Prophets and Kings has an interesting little quote on that. Okay. It says, nor dared Daniel and his three companions risk the enervating effect of luxury and dissipation mm -hmm. on physical, mental, and spiritual development. Mm -hmm. They were acquainted with the history of Nadab and Abihu, the record of whose intemperance is it, it, and its results had been preserved in the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they knew that their own physical and mental power would be injuriously affected by the use of a king's wine. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, very appropriate. What page was that? Uh, Prophets and Kings 482. Someone wants to look that up. Okay, let's go to some specific things in the book of Daniel. The prophecies, the great time prophecies covering Daniel's day to the end of the world, basically. Have those things proven to be true and accurate when, when correctly understood? Like clockwork. Like clockwork. Well, if, you're, and if, what, you're willing, if you're willing to, <clears throat> to take it and read it and, and believe it, uh, mm -hmm. came mighty close to predicting exactly when Jesus was supposed to come. Yes. That's a... Exactly. That's, now, a, that's a pretty remarkable timetable. The point of that is that even if Daniel was written later, it was still before Jesus, right? Or was it yeah. after Jesus? No, yeah, it would still be after, before yeah. Jesus. Well, here's, the, here's yeah. the other point that I didn't mention. There were a number of parts of the book of Daniel were included in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those things 
we have the, the, some of the original copies from the Dead Sea Scrolls that are dated older, older, 100 years or so before the time of Christ. So now you've got another problem. Scholars will recognize this. The rest of us might not think this is such a problem, but scholars will recognize if a book is written by a pretend author and so forth like this, it takes a period of time for that to be sort of accepted by people. It doesn't just come out and it's immediately accepted. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what we have here is a, a book that they would say was written around 165 B.C., and within one lifetime, it's being accepted by the most conservative group of Jews known to man as documented scripture within one lifetime. Completely impossible. Mm -hmm. Completely impossible by anything that we know about. This so, may want be one of the peripheral um, benefits of the book of Daniel in that um, it is one book which has uh, attempted by many people to have been discredited. Mm -hmm and yet it has been validated over and over again, yeah. which gives you confidence in the other materials yeah. as well that are in here. Yes. Weren't those Dead Sea Scrolls, many of them about 200 from, uh, written at least 200 years before Christ? Um, or, or I would it? have to go back and look at first but I think about some that for sure. Some of them are quite old, yeah. So if, if Daniel was in that lot, mm -hmm. And then when they claimed that, according to my Bible, that it was 164 to 167 B.C. by yeah. some, yeah. yeah it's, uh, now, isn't it just like Satan to take the prophecy that predicted Jesus and to turn that prophecy into something that uh, concerns him, like in, um, that just doesn't point to Jesus uh, in the Left Behind series? Uh, the prophecy in Daniel is completely um, changed. Yeah, but we, and we're running out of time for the first part of our session here, but we need to, to deal with that issue. Does God adequately and correctly predict? And, and what, things, what things are actually predicted by the prophecies in Daniel? We need to, we need to sort of we don't have time to deal with every one of them. But looking at the overall picture, what things were actually predicted um, from assuming that it was written by Daniel 500 years before Christ, what things, how many kingdoms are predicted, what, what, what events connected to those kings are predicted? Do we know anything about the kings that were connected to those kingdoms? Does it say anything about those? Um, and then down, what happened after those major kingdoms? Do we have anything about future events, maybe still even future in our day? Those are the kind of things that uh, we need to look at. And, and again, we don't need to take a long time. We just need to try to say, assuming that you believe that Daniel was written by Daniel and that he was assisted by God and that God can predict the future, and I realize those are, those are huge issues for some people, but assuming those things are true, what does the book of Daniel actually tell us? Because then we're going to want to say, if that's true, what does it tell us about God? Those are the issues we want to look at. So we start out with the book, we start out with two sections of the book of Daniel that are going to be major issues. We're going to look at chapter 2 and the predictions there, and then we're going to look at chapter 7 and comparisons of that, and then we're going to look at chapters 8 and 9. We're not going to take time to look at each one of those, but those are the chapters you want to look at if you want to, real quickly, while we take a break, and then we'll be right back and talk about what those things might actually say to us about God. Don't go away.
Thank you for staying by. Uh, hope you have your Bible in hand. Daniel 2. Just real quickly, what does it say to us in terms of prophecy? Remember, this is a, a dream that was given to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and no one could interpret it. No one could even, un, even knew what the dream was until Daniel was called up. And Daniel brought in, he says, I can tell you the dream. I can tell you what it means. Not because I have any magical powers on my own, but because of what? Because of my God. Because, of, because God. of my God told me. And he saw that giant statue. And what, what did the giant statue consist of? It, it said that Babylon was not going to last forever and there were going to be other uh, kingdoms, which oh is dear. quite insulting to the king. And then it predicted that all of the earthly kingdoms would be shattered by mm -hmm. something coming from uh, outer space, uh, so, such yeah. as Or from Jesus. a mountain, actually. Oh, from yeah. a mountain. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. So we have what kind of kingdoms might be represented by those? The head of gold? the arms and chest of silver, the thighs and belly of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. What do those things represent? What kingdoms? Kingdom. Yeah. Well, Babylon was the head of gold. Mm -hmm. Medo-Persia was the breast and arms of silver. Mm -hmm. Greece followed that mm -hmm. as the thighs of brass, mm -hmm. which was followed by Rome. Mm -hmm. And then Rome was divided into multiple parts, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for the stone. We're waiting for the stone, okay. So maybe there's some parts of that prophecy still coming. Absolutely. Yeah. Why did God give this prophecy to the king instead of to Daniel directly? Mm -hmm. Good question. What do you think? Well, <laughs> Daniel doesn't have a marketing agent to, to put out the information. You've got to give it to somebody, some big wig, so it'll yeah. make, a, exactly. make an impression. The other thing that's interesting... Everybody finds out about it if the king has a dream, especially if the king says, and if you can't interpret my dream, you're dead. Yeah. If but you the, can't tell me what the dream is yeah. and interpret it, Right, you're dead. exactly. But it's interesting that you can have a vision of something and not understand it. Uh-huh. That's, that's very key, and I just wonder about even some prophets who have visions, whether they, how do you know if they've interpreted it correctly? I mean... Well, a lot of prophets don't interpret their... Vision. Their own they vision. Give, they give the visions, and, and then it's our job to interpret them. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, and we line those, the way we, we try to identify those is we, we line them up with the beasts in Daniel 7, don't we? And what beasts were in Daniel 7? A lion. There's a lion. A leopard. A leopard. Well, a bear first. A bear, I'm sorry. A lion, a bear, a, bear, a, bear, leopard, a leopard. And then and a beast. A nondescript beast, right? And then when we come to Daniel 8 and 9, we have a ram and a he-goat, don't we? Yeah. Like that. And some of those actually named, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, and there are ways, without taking time to do that right now, there's ways to identify that at least three of those kingdoms are clearly named. Babylon is clearly named. Medo-Persia is clearly named. Greece is cl clearly named. The only one that's not clearly named of those kingdoms is Rome. what we call Rome, which was what, what not coming for a number of years yet, which, by the way, was the dominant power, at least one of the dominant powers, when the critics say the book was written, why wouldn't it have been mentioned? If you're writing resistance literature, as they would call it, against the predominant power of those days, you should be writing against Rome, right? Yeah. The rising power at that point in time. So again, that... And didn't these kingdoms have characteristics of the animals, like... Um, yes. Uh, Medo-Persia... Um, what animal was me to Persia? Bear. Um, and it was, I mean, everything fits. Like w the bear rose up on one side, and the interpreters look at that and they say, "That's not the way bears behave. Uh, it must there must be a mistake in the in the writing." No, it's talking about Media and Persia. And Media was there first, but Persia rose up and was more powerful later. So uh, it all fits. I mean, in in, in you know, every detail, these prophecies can be worked out and show. And 
the, the parts that's particularly damning to the people who don't want to believe their prophecies is Daniel 9, where the prophecies uh, of specifically come down to prophetic times about the Jews and prediction of the Messiah to come. Specifically mentioning kingdoms in Daniel 8, 20. Yeah. It says, the ram you saw that had two horns represents the kingdoms of Media and Persia. The goat represents the kingdom of Greece. Right, exactly. How can you be more specific than that? No. And, and in Daniel 2, Daniel told the king, you are that head of gold. Yeah, exactly. Now, isn't that kind of God to outline for us mm -hmm. the general principle as to what the world is going to go through? Mm -hmm. mm. Now, all these, all these kingdoms, as mentioned, they were in existence, right, at that time? When in Daniel's day? Yeah. No. Well, they were. They no, wasn't Rome there a, Rome was, a seed? It wasn't really. Well, that wasn't mentioned though. I'm Medo talking Persia. about all the Persia and Greece were there. There were there were kingdoms of that nature. They didn't amount to much, but they were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Medo Persia, of course, rose by the time Daniel was in his older age, but then Greece didn't rise for two hundred more years. But it was there. It was there. But still, you know, you'd be sticking out your neck to say that this little kingdom over here is going to take over everything pretty soon. Yeah, exactly. At the time, so. Yeah. You think this information was disseminated to the rest of the um, Hebrews that were in uh, held captive there? <clears throat> you think it was just something Probably. that they kept between, or that they said, hey, you know, well, this information's come available. What's going to happen to us and what's going to happen yeah. to the world in the future? Uh, well, that's one of the things we want to get to. Um, let's, let's look at chapter 9 a little bit because this talks about some very specific details. And again, we can't obviously take time to go through the, the whole thing, but Daniel 8, 14 says... And I quote, I heard the other angel answer, it will continue for 2,300 evenings and mornings during which sacrifice will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. So we have an angel here explaining this. Yes. What this dream is about and what yes. these visions are. And he says it's going to be 2,300 years for this thing to happen. And then without going into a lot of detail about that for right now, hold off on that for a moment, we, we go into chapter 9 and it says... Of those 2,300 years, a period of 70 weeks, that would be 490 days, or 490 prophetic years, is to be cut off for the Jewish people. So we're using the, the customary understanding that in the, certainly in the book of Daniel, when we're talking about years. Uh -huh. uh, we're talking we about days, we, they we, mean we, years. That's right. We're, it's, it's a prophetic uh, um, time way to present time period yeah. and, and it really means years. And so if we go back and we try to look at these things and if you compare it takes a little bit it takes quite a bit of research you have to compare Daniel with the book of, Ezek uh, of Ezra I'm sorry and Nehemiah and so forth go back and forth you can nail down the fact that this prophecy begins at 457 B.C. If you, if you date 457 B.C. and you go down 2,300 years, well, let's go to the 490 years first. What, what does that take us to? Well, remember that there's no Inside. zero year. Yeah. So you have to add one in terms of strict math. It, from 457, you go down 490 years, it takes you to 34 A.D. What happened in 34 A.D.? Jesus was baptized. No, you're getting a little ahead of the story. What happened in 30? That's when the gospel went to the... That's to the when the Gentiles. Jewish people were finally rejected as God's true people, not as individuals, but as, as the specific group. And the group to carry God's message from that point on were, was the Christian church. That's the point at which the Jews it launched an, an, an intense uh, persecution of Christians. And you yeah. can read about that in Acts 7, especially Acts 8, the beginning of Acts 8. Isn't that the very year that Stephen tried to re-emphasize why Jesus came and the Jews said, we don't want to hear it, stone you, and they killed him. Yeah. 
And in that last year, Daniel 9 says, something very important is going to happen at the beginning and something very important is going to happen in the end. In that last week. That last week, that last period of seven years. Thank you. The beginning of that seven years was in A.D. 27, and that was the time when Jesus began. Yeah. He, was, he was baptized and he began his ministry. Three and a half years later, he was crucified in, uh, at Passover in A.D. 31. So this all fits perfectly. Well, then, what about the rest of the 2300 years? How much is left if you subtract 490 from 2300? Almost 2,000 years. Almost. Now do a little careful math here. We want it. God is very precise. Let's be precise. A little under 2,000 years. 1,810 years. If you take A.D. 34 and you go 1,810 more years, where does that take you? 1844. 1844. What happened in 1844? It was a big religious awakening. Uh, there was a huge uh, religious in awakening. In this country and even globally. Yeah, there was a big awakening. And, and, uh, and some it was of us, due to these prophecies. Yes, People it was due to these prophecies and, and understanding these, things, these prophecies. And my goodness, something's happening here. Yeah. And at, that, at one point, they thought that was going to be the second coming of Jesus, didn't they? But later they realized that, no, that's not what happened. It was the beginning of the final, well, the beginning of the time of the end, not the, 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 not the, the end of time, but the time of the end. A final period of this earth's history where some very important events are supposed to take place, as predicted here in the book, and it, it began in the year 1844. And so, all of those events happened like clockwork. What does that tell us? <clears throat> well, I, I think it's, it tells us that God can foretell the future. Yes. And so that, not, that's not, something it says about God. Not, yeah. just, not just in tens or twenties of years, but, yeah. but thousands. thousands Millennia. of years. Yeah. Millennia. Thousands Pretty of accurately. Years. Yes. And just be real, real, real accurate. There's, yeah. a, there's a principle in science that if you have a, a complicated system, you're trying to understand it, you go with the one that fits the most data. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it, it tends to work, you say, okay, that must be the way it is because it all fits together and makes a good, makes a good. And that is exactly the scientific method of studying scripture. And it works. Okay. Now, we have mentioned, just briefly, we, we just very briefly covered the prophecies. The other major part of the book of Daniel is the diet on chapter one. But what about... Uh, the Shadrach and Meshach and the Abednego story. Isn't that a little bit fairy tale kind of stuff? What happened there? Well, uh, no more fairy tale than Daniel in the lion's den. Okay, we're going to come. Yeah. To, we're going to come to that one next. <laughs> well, the king decided that he was going to erect a large image and call everybody together, and they were to bow down and worship this image. And what was unusual about the image? Do you remember? It was all gold. all gold instead of just. It a head wasn't of just a head of gold. He wanted the whole thing to be gold. Okay, <laughs> including the feet and toes. Yes, and what happened? And no rocks. <laughs> yeah, no rocks. King wanted everybody to bow to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult thing. Three were. people did not. Three people did not, and the king was the king happy about that? Was it? No. no. He decided he wasn't happy about it. What did he say? You will get he knew these, these young men were smart people and they had been very, it served him very well. And he said, I'll give you another chance, right? And they said, give as many chances as you like. We're not going to bow down to your image. Well, boy, you don't know. Those Oriental potentates, those magistrates of Nebuchadnezzar's time, Nebuchadnezzar's time weren't accustomed to being denied like that. They, were expected, they expected everybody to bow to them in, in every detail. And so what did he say? Daniel 3.15 says, Do you think that there is any God who can save you? Mm -hmm. And they're quoted in seven, verse 17 as saying, If the God whom we serve is able to save us from the burning uh, serve, uh, furnace and from your power, then he will. And he did mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even if he doesn't, even if he does. they're not going to bow. Yeah. So they had made up their mind that no matter what happens, they weren't mm -hmm. going to bow, whether God was going to save them or not. 
So and why, why were these three guys saved and, and Stephen wasn't? And lots of others. It was a different so situation. Someday, well, God will answer those questions for us. Well, well the, the, the challenge was, could God save him from yeah. this? I mean, there was no challenge with Steve. Yeah. See, here's, Steve. I think that's right. I think the answer yeah. is, okay, we've got, and, and, and you'll find this right through Scripture. The, the ten plagues in Egypt is a perfect example. When one of these pagan authorities of some sort pits their God against the real God, then God says, okay, it's time for me to, to stand up and do something. Especially when a lot of people are watching. Yeah. And they're going to make a decision and, yes, based and, on what happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real, real opportunity for God to, and you know, it wasn't just the Israelites who were captive here. They were, they were ever, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was in the business of going all around and pulling these people in there. So they were, they were top Egyptians. They were top, oh, yeah. uh, all of the secretaries of state and yep. national treasurers of all these different countries. They were right here. Yeah. And by the way, Stephen, 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 um, his death was very powerful. Mm -hmm. And his prayer, very powerful. Other than, you know, perhaps Jesus, as a human being, he, he Stephen said, God forgive them. Yeah. They know not what they do and yeah. don't hold this sin against them. And when we read that, that's something for us to learn. Yeah. And we've got a lot of learning to do on this planet. Okay, and so now we come to the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Does what this, is that? Does this tell, tell us? us that when we're in hard places that we just keep on praying? Yeah. Well, but who, who put Daniel in that hard place? How did he get in that hard place? Uh, there's people uh, probably trying to stab him in the, in the back just constantly. Well, I mean, here, here's, a, here's a young man, well, he was not so young at this point in time, an older man, but he's, he, he ends up being prime minister in, in Babylon, and all of a sudden now he's prime minister in Medo-Persia, and there's got to be people who wanted his job. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so what did they do? They, they said in chapter <laughs> 6, verse 5, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Okay, so something they're, they're connected thinking. with his religion. And what did they do? They, they, made they wrote up a law. The king. They con conned the king, actually, uh -huh. because they had, he didn't have any idea of the consequences of that new law that they... They buttered him up and to. they said, yeah, and he signed it without thinking of what, what of the implications, didn't he? And the yeah, law said of that people were supposed to worship only him, mm -hmm. the king. For the next 60 days. Mm -hmm. I thought it was only 30 days. I, I'm sorry, you're right, 30, 30 days. days. Yeah. Okay. Make sure it wasn't too bad, so he yeah. limited it. Could but that was just enough, you know, they just to get him in get trouble. Him, yes. Yeah. You just kind of lay low and maybe take a vacation and go off yeah. to some place where you could kind of do your own little religious thing and nobody would really notice too much and at the 30 days come back and yeah why not but no he had to <clears throat> pray in the open well, yeah goes out it's on his porch like, for Pete's sake three times a day it's yeah. almost like he said bring it on bring it on you know he just he didn't hide anything you, he went out and what you have to take this story of Daniel and the lion's den and John the Baptist in prison and say that however God works it out, it's okay with me. Either mm -hmm. your head rolls or you're saved. That's right. Mm -hmm. But in either case, it's you can have my body, but Jesus has my spirit. Yeah. And in the future, aren't we going to be brought into a hard place where we're going to stick out like a sore thumb? Yeah. And we won't be able to retreat and take a vacation and do our prayers and people will know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's well, a happy thought. So here so, they trapped you. Daniel. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, they have found these places where they kept lions in the city of Babylon. It, it's well documented those places were there. And he was thrown in. 
And what happened? He was preserved. Verse 19 of Daniel 6. At dawn, the king got up and hurried to the pit mm -hmm. where Daniel had, was. When he got there, he called out anxiously, Daniel, servant of the living God, was the God you serve so loyally mm -hmm. able to save you from the lions? And that's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This that, was a test of the God. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of that passage. It says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but those who can... Kill the Not soul. Kill soul. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And the king said all that in an anguished voice. He really he, liked Daniel. Yeah. He was like yeah. worried about him, it seems. He must have had a good idea that, yeah. that Daniel would be down there mm -hmm. or he wouldn't have been out there asking exactly. questions. At dawn. At dawn. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He, he, he suspected that Daniel was he okay. Had, he had enough experience with, with Daniel already and knew enough, right. probably some of the stories about what had happened previously right. that he knew. Mm -hmm. He well, heard something about the fiery furnace and Shadrach, Meshach, Probably, and yeah, other things that happened before. I'm going I'm to run through some, in our few, last few minutes, I'm going to run through some of the things that I think Daniel teaches us about God. See what you think of these. Conservative Christians have been acquainted with a song, Dare to be a Daniel, for a long time. What does that suggest to you? Look at some of the issues and challenges that are dealt with in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is something like a final exam for the Old Testament. How well have we learned our lessons? How do, we, how do you think you would measure up to Daniel and his friends? And here are some of the issues. Daniel was willing to risk his life for what he believed. He refused to give even nominal worship to Nebuchadnezzar's God. How many of us be willing to die for what we believe? What does that say about God? Yeah. It says that it really ma God really mattered to Daniel, didn't it? It mattered to the, Daniel. The, the relationship. Exactly right. Yeah. Then Daniel was willing to spend years eating only vegetables. And we talked about the possibility there might have been other things included in that, in that diet. Rather than the world's best cuisine, how many of us reject eating foods that are unhealthy because it's the right thing to do? Think about it. But this says something about God, in that God will bless individuals doing what he asks them to do. Not only that, he directs us about what, what kind of diet is best for us. How about mm -hmm. we do it because it makes us feel good? Why not? I mean, if, if it's making us closer to God, why, why wouldn't it? Yeah, if, well, most people healthy. get drunk because they feel good. Yeah, I think There's it's something more better than, than that. I guess uh, they have a different <laughs> definition of feeling good. Yeah. Well, the Daniel, day, yeah. we need to keep moving. Daniel and his friends studied diligently for years so they could correctly represent Yahweh. When asked about their abilities, they gave credit to God. Do we do the same? Do we represent God correctly in our daily lives? And uh, there are lots of Sometimes places. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to say that God's my leader if I do something bad, so. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel was able to give the king the explanation of his dream, but he refused to take any credit for it. He gave credit only to God. Would we do the same? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to be martyrs, even to be burned alive, rather than give the slightest lip service to the worship of Nebuchadnezzar, Marduk, or any god of this world. Would we do the same and remember that because of that, they were walking in the fire along with who was in there with, with them? Jesus, Jesus himself. Yeah. Yep. Daniel was determined to worship God in exactly the way he believed God wanted him to, even if it meant being eaten by lions. He was respectful of the king even when he was at the bottom of a lion's pit. Are we always faithful and courteous? In a time when calendars and written number systems were just being developed and were very confusing and not very precise, God gave Daniel a vision which has worked out exactly over hundreds, even thousands of years. God knows math. Does that tell us anything about God's ability to reach different groups at different times in history? Yahweh was able to give details about each of the rising kingdoms that allow us to clearly identify them and when they arose in history, we can trust Him in the future. In a time when it looked like Yahweh's people were disappearing into oblivion, that's what it looked like, didn't it? And many of them had lost confidence in His guidance. 
He demonstrates that he understands even the distant future, and it is clearly in his control. God shows that he is superior to each of these kingdoms because he not only predicts uh, their exact behavior and timing, but ultimately replaces all of them with his own kingdom. While the nations that arise here on this earth conquer their rivals by military might and power, God rules by what? By bringing everyone into fair trial and preserving those who are shown to be fit citizens for his kingdom. God does not rule by force, but by truth. In the book of Daniel, we see that God is working behind the scenes, yet on a personal basis with individuals. He's in control of the universe, but he cares for and about each one of us. The prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, John, and that would be the book of Revelation, and in modern times, among Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White, are clearly interlinked and show us that God has been working for our good from the beginning to the end of this world's history. God knew about each step in the history of this world and planned for our salvation. And if you get a chance, look at Daniel 10, because in Daniel 10, Daniel 9 and 10, Daniel prays. Especially at, at the end of Daniel 9, you'll find out that he prays and he says, God, I know that we have done a terrible thing. We're a bunch of sinners. We have misrepresented you, but don't let that blacken your name. What matters now is your reputation. God said, you're right, Daniel, and I will make it right. So by using one prophet to confirm and add to the prophecies of another, God provides a firmer basis for our faith. So what do we believe if we believe in the book of Daniel? That God exists, that he's a creator and sustainer of the universe, that he has an intimate knowledge of our personal lives, that he has the power to act in human history, that he has omniscience, including foreknowledge, that he will bring history of the world, uh, the history of this world to a conclusion, that he will bring every human being into final judgment. That is, the book, the Bible, then, is primarily about God and not about us. Do we believe that we have a responsibility to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ? All these messages are presented in the book of Daniel. Can we present them, these messages clearly enough to convince others to follow him? Thank you for listening.